Um, okay, so uh, let's go ahead and start with our digestive system. As I mentioned, we're only going to cover a few of the slides and then uh, until about 11 o'clock and then uh, we'll pause at that point. So for the digestive system, uh, oh, sorry, one second, let me bring my chat box up just in case you guys send me any message. That way I can keep up with this, sorry. Okay. Um, so the, uh, one of the first thing we learned in this class was that uh, the abdominal pelvic region uh, can be divided to four quadrants, uh, which was the right upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, and then left upper quadrant and left lower quadrant. Um, so something that you guys uh, do need to know as we go through the PowerPoint, I'm not gonna spend time on this specific slide is as we learn the location of each of the organs, uh, you should be able to place them uh, in the corresponding quadrants of the body. FYI, as you can see, uh, a small and large intestine, for instance, will expand through all four quadrants. Uh, so that's something that you will notice. Uh, but for the rest of the structures, uh, things like liver, your gallbladder, um, 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 appendix, um, things like reproductive organs, et cetera, are limited to one of the quadrants or one or two of the quadrants rather than all four. Uh, the other thing that you do need to, to remember, hopefully from uh, our first lecture is the nine regions associated with the abdominal pelvic region. Um, similarly, uh, that is also something that you guys need to know in terms of the organs located within each of the regions. As I mentioned, we're not gonna cover them individually. Uh, as we go through them and you learn the location of each of these organs, then you have a good idea where they would be located within each of these regions. Now, when we're talking about your digestive system, a couple of things that should be noted is that um, we have the path of the digestive system, uh, which basically starts with your mouth or your oral cavity and ends with the anal, um, anus, of course, I should say, rectum and then eventually anus. So that's the path the food takes. It's a continuous uh, tube that, again, uh, develops at the embryonic age. Um, but in addition to the path the food takes, we also have what we call accessory organs, uh, where the food does not pass through those organs. Uh, however, those organs do contribute to the effective process of digestion. For instance, these accessory organs are your liver, your gallbladder, your pancreas, salivary glands, uh, and uh, I think those are the only ones. And tonsils, some people mention tonsils. Uh, but again, for gallbladder, liver, pancreas, salivary gland, even your teeth, tongue, uh, food does not pass through them. However, they do contribute to the effective process of digestion. So let's go ahead and take a look at the path the food takes through the digestive system. Um, so the path, um, first of all, it divided to what we call an alimentary canal. Uh, sometimes it's also referred to a gastrointestinal tract, uh, which basically means the stomach intestines. As I mentioned, it starts with your mouth, um, goes through what we call pharynx. That should sound familiar from our digestive system. Eventually goes down the esophagus, the stomach, and then a small intestine, large intestine, and eventually out of the body. And then again, as I mentioned, the accessory glands, things like teeth, tongue, gallbladder, sal uh, salivary glands, liver, and pancreas. Now, I'm not spending a lot of time talking about each of them because that's basically what the rest of the PowerPoint will be. We'll talk about each of them and clarify the specific path the food takes as it goes through the alimentary canal. So this is one of my favorite pictures when it comes to your exam. Um, uh, you do need to be very comfortable with this picture. Um, I usually have um, either ask you guys to identify a specific component uh, from the picture, or I give you a specific function and I ask you which of these letters um, complete that task or complete that function. Now, when we're looking at this, I want to just kind of give you the uh, path of food through uh, the 
digestive system. So I'm gonna number them just directly into here. Uh, so you guys can also uh, follow that. Uh, so it basically it starts with your mouth. It goes to your pharynx, uh, but I am going to break down the pharynx to two parts. Uh, this should sound familiar, oropharynx. Sorry, my chat box is in front of me. Oropharynx for number two, and then Laryngopharynx for number three. Uh, then food passes through what we call your esophagus, which is this long tube coming down. From esophagus, it goes to your stomach. And from a stomach, it works its way to the small intestine. But again, if I ask you guys to write the path of food and you just say small intestine, you only gonna get partial credit. So I do want you guys to write the breakdown for the small intestine, starting with duodenum, jejunum, and then ileum for the three segmentations of the small intestine. So basically this is the duodenum right here, which is the shortest part. The top folds right here at the center, that's the jejunum, and the bottom folds right down here would be your ileum. Large intestine, on the other hand, kind of forms this uh, surrounding uh, area around the small intestine. So the first part of the large intestine is this pouch like you see right here called cecum, which is number nine then the food is gonna move up. So as the food move up this way, that forms your ascending colon. It's gonna go across, that's your transverse colon. And then food is gonna come down. And again, downward means descending colon. So again, when you do talk about colon, colon is a general terminology we use for large intestine. Last part of the colon or the last part of the um, colon where the food is being processed is this curvature you see at the end uh, called the sigmoid colon, so number 13. It works its way toward the rectum. Uh, rectum is basically when the fecal matter gets stored. And then eventually anal canal and anus, which are I'm going to number both of them 15 because I usually don't separate those two from each other. So again, if I ask you guys to write the path, write down the path of food, this is what I expect you guys to write. Writing just pharynx or small intestine or large intestine will not be sufficient. You get less than half the credit for that question. Uh, so make sure you guys break it down to individual structure or segmentation. Can I answer any questions for you guys so far? Anything that just didn't make sense so far? No, good. Couple of things that are also can be noted in this picture. Um, so uh, the appendix is basically part of your um, lymphatic system. Um, it is attached as part of, or the beginning of the large intestine, but uh, it is not, it's not part of the digestive system itself. So thank you for asking that. Now, in terms of the accessory glands uh, that we have, and I mentioned, uh, we have salivary glands. There are three sets of them, and I'll go into more detail about them in a few minutes. Uh, but you have a paired glands on either side of your face, right about here, and these are called the parotid glands. You have one right underneath your tongue. Uh, called the sublingual glands. Kind of think about language, tongue is helping you with your language, so sublingual. And then one that is built up in your mandible, these ones right here called the submandibular because it's built into your mandible, submandibular gland. Uh, I do expect you guys to know the three locations, three names of the salivary gland. And then also as we go discuss this, um, 
what is the type of saliva that each of these glands are producing. The other thing I do want you guys to notice is the three other accessory glands that are mentioned, uh, which is your liver, this big uh, structure, this triangular structure sitting on the right hand side, uh, right underneath your diaphragm. Uh, gallbladder, which is this green structure tucked in underneath your liver. And then pancreas right here that is tucked in underneath your stomach. So these three, uh, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas are going to be extremely important in terms of providing um, fluid that helps with the digestion of the food. Now, what are some of the processes that are happening when we are digesting our food? Um, so first one is ingestion, which is basically taking your food by mouth. Uh, so you're ingesting your food. Uh, we also have what we call propulsion. Uh, so if you take a look at the picture I have here, uh, propulsion is described as basically any green lines or squeaky lines, I guess I should say, uh, that you see in this picture. Propulsion is the way you move food through your digestive system. So that is, starts with basically you swallowing your food, food going down the pharynx and esophagus, moving down through the stomach, as you can see the lines, and then eventually going through the small intestine, through the large intestine, and eventually basically pooping out whatever your body doesn't want. Um, very, very scientific, pooping out. <laughs> Sorry. The fecal matter being removed from our system. Um, digestion, so propulsion, all it does, let me go back. Propulsion, all it's doing is basically moving the food so it doesn't get, get stuck in one position. Another thing I wanna clarify, which is kind of something that comes up a lot of time if people have surgeries. You know, one of the first thing they ask you um, or one of the biggest problem right after surgery is what guys? Other than pain, pain is the common one, but after surgery, what is the, one of the main problems? Constipation, correct. Um, so a lot of times when a person has gone through some sort of trauma and surgery is considered trauma um, uh, or um, a main one being any type of surgery that has to do with abdominal pelvic, even right after giving birth, a lot of people become constipated. And the main reason is because when you have such sort of trauma, the propulsion movement, which is passing the food through the digestive system, it slows down significantly. And that is slows down basically what causes constipation, okay? So if you ever wonder what is the thing, any sort of trauma, which includes surgery, surgery is the trauma, affects the propulsion movement of the digestive system, which leads to uh, constipation. Now, um, Propulsion, the word propulsion is a general terminology. Uh, we also can use the word peristalsis, uh, which is basically a squeezing. A lot of people describe it as a squeezing a toothpaste. As the toothpaste moves, you continue pushing and a squeezing. And I think I have a picture of that. Yeah, so see, this is the peristalsis movement. So you squeeze, food move forward, then you squeeze right behind it, and then the food keeps moving forward, right? That's peristalsis or propulsion. Here's another picture of that, same process. Sorry. You're moving the food through your digestive system. Now, as the food passing through the digestive system, the next thing you wanna do is digestion, which simply means breaking down your food. Now, food breakdown happens at two levels. One is what we call mechanical digestion. Mechanical digestion is simply put is helping to chop your food to little pieces. So if you, let's say, if you take a bite of a burger, the action of chewing your food or the churning motion of your stomach, which kind of like moves and squishes the food everywhere, that's mechanical digestion. So you're using some sort of food to mix your food uh, or to mix and break down your food. Now, another version of mechanical digestion is a word called segmentation. And segmentation is uh, basically what we can see as these 
purple arrows, this kind of twisting arrows that you see happening typically in the stomach, which is that churning motion I mentioned, as well as in your small intestine. So here is what segmentation looks like. So imagine this part is the juices that are helping with the digestion of your food. Here is the actual food. So notice how they are broke down and separated at this point. So when segmentation happen, instead of muscles contracting here and here, they're gonna contract right in between them. So you're gonna take a piece of the, some of the juices and some of the food and you're gonna bring them together. And you're gonna keep repeating this. So it's kind of like kneading a dough, I guess. Mix, 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 mix at different locations. Why is this so important? Why do you wanna mix your digestive juices with your food? Because that's gonna help you effectively digest your food. So having that mixture, having that random movement, not only helping you break down your food, but it's also helping you mixing it with the juices to better digest your food. Is this making sense so far, guys? Is there any question about that? Awesome. Yeah, guys, please type your questions. I don't, I, I just assume if something doesn't make sense, it's not you alone. Other people may have the same questions, so just go ahead and ask it. Um, I wouldn't say lubrication because lubrication, all it's gonna do, it's gonna help it move along. Um, it's not lubricating it. Digestive juices literally help break down the food. Um, so it's like pulling, pouring acid on something and it's gonna dissolve something. So that's not the same thing as lubrication, but um, okay. Now, when we're talking about the word digestion, which means breakdown, one thing that we mentioned is mechanical digestion, which means again, you're chopping, 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 chopping down your food. Chemical digestion is another type. So chemical digestion is literally taking your food and breaking it down to its simplest form. Taking your food and breaking it down to its simplest form. So what does that mean? So what are the three main food groups we have, guys? Let me ask you that three main food groups you have. Take a moment, type them for me. Meat is not a main food group. What does that meat belong to? Mm -hmm. Protein, right? What else? Carbs and fat, you got it. So proteins, carbs, and fat are your three main groups. Now, if I'm chemically digesting carbohydrates or carbs, what is that gets broken down to? Anybody? Sugar, so correct, or simple as sugar, which is glucose. So carbohydrate chemical breakdown or chemical digestion form simple sugar. Okay, what about proteins? So if I'm doing protein, if I'm breaking down chemically, what does it form? What's the simplest form? Amino acid, you got it. So protein chemical digestion forms amino acids, correct. And what about fats? So fat chemical digestion form what? Anybody? Starts with a G and an F. There's two words, two parts. No, nobody. Glycerol and fatty acid. So be careful when I ask questions about digestion, guys. If I'm asking you what is mechanical digestion of food, it doesn't matter. Everything happens regardless of if I'm eating a piece of protein or a chunk of butter <laughs> or a piece of lettuce, okay? It doesn't matter. Mechanical digestion is going to be equally happening for all of my food groups. Okay? Chemical digestion happens specifically. As in protein, if I chemically digest it, it's only going to form amino acid. The other thing that I want to mention before I forget, chemical digestion 
relies on enzymes. So if I don't have the correct enzyme, then I will not be able to chemically digest the food. So let me, let me give you an example. If I eat cheese, okay, my body is gonna take that piece of cheese or my mouth is gonna take that piece of cheese and I'm gonna chew it, right? My, my teeth doesn't care if I'm eating a piece of meat or again, a piece of cheese, right? It doesn't care. But what if it goes farther down into my small intestine and I don't have the corresponding enzyme to break down that fat, that piece of cheese to the glycerol and fatty acid? Then that piece of cheese remains as a piece of cheese, okay? So people, let's say, let me give you an example. People who are lactose intolerant, we've mentioned that before. What did they miss? Anybody remember? If you're lactose intolerant, what are you missing? Lactase, correct. And what is lactase exactly? It's an enzyme, correct. So lactase is an enzyme that's going to break down the sugar in dairy product to simple sugars. So when you lack lactase, which is the enzyme, you are unable to chemically digest your dairy sugar. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? I know I'm spending a lot of time on this, but I really wanna make sure this is clear to everybody. So when I'm asking a question, mechanical digestion for all food happens, your body doesn't distinguish it, but chemical digestion, you must have the corresponding enzyme to be able to function and carry the job. Okay, absorption. Absorption is basically, I chopped down my food to the smallest piece. Now I have a bunch of fatty acid. I have my simple sugar. I have amino acids. Now I'm going to take them from the digestive system and bring them into my blood vessels, which is basically the picture you see as these red arrows going into my blood vessels right here. Any unwanted material that I have would be removed from the digestive system through the process of defecation or pooping <laughs> for better scientific terminology. I like to just say that because it makes people laugh. Okay. <laughs> Not that extensive. <laughs> All right. Something else that we talked about before, and I'm just kind of bringing that up here in only in, in sense of your digestive system is the double serous membrane that I mentioned before called peritoneum. Again, peritoneum, anytime we talk about that serous membrane, <laughs> yes, it is a very popular word. <laughs> peritoneum is uh, made up of two layers. The one that is directly attached itself to the organs is the visceral layer or the inner layer. And the outer layer is called the parietal peritoneum. So double layer. The space between these layers is referred to as the peritoneal cavity. So that's the space. So if you look at this picture I have here, um, the, the inner layer that I have, which is this layer right here around my liver, that's the inner layer. So that's my visceral peritoneum. The one that's attached to the abdominal wall, which is this layer, that's the parietal peritoneum. And the gap between those two layers would be the peritoneal cavity. Now, the complicated aspect of this serous membrane, uh, which is only present in the digestive viscera, is that it also helps secure the organs in their place. What does that mean? So think about your heart and your lungs, guys. How do I keep them in place? How do I make sure that my heart doesn't fall into my abdominal cavity? What is sitting right underneath my heart and my lungs that secure its place? No, underneath it. Although ribs also provide help and support. Diaphragm, right. 
So diaphragm is sitting right underneath them. And with the help of rib cage, you're basically securing these organs in place. But think about it, guys. For the abdominal organs, we really don't have any of that support, right? It's not like diaphragm is gonna make sure my stomach stays in one place or my liver stays in one place. So I kind of think about this um, serous membrane, this peritoneum as um, a Spider-Man and its webs, okay? And what it does, it basically takes the liver and makes sure it's secure with the, um, the walls of the uh, abdominal cavity by connecting them with these uh, strings or connection points, like literally like a spider webs. So when you look at these connection points to secure the location of the organs within the abdominal pelvic cavity, they generally refer to as mesenteries. So that's an uh, umbrella term for them. So mesenteries, there are actually a few of them. Uh, they call lesser omentum, greater omentum, mesentery proper, mesocolon, and falciform ligament. Now, let's take a look at what they actually do. And I don't want to detail for you guys. All I want you to know is what organ they're associated with. That's, we're going to keep it really simple. So mesentery proper, which is one of the organs, it helps secure jejunum and ileum, which were part of your a small intestine. Greater omentum hangs from the bottom of the, and I want to show you this. Here is my stomach, greater omentum, which is this kind of um, pack of fat that you see right here, hangs from the bottom of the stomach. Lesser omentum, which is this kind of fat right here in the yellow, hangs from the smaller curvature of the stomach called the lesser curvature. So lesser omentum is up here. Greater omentum is hanging from below the stomach. The next one you see is mesentery or mesentery proper, which is what you see here as this kind of really kind of sheer looking, very thin layer uh, that surrounds the intestine. So what you see here, that's, that lady is basically holding, these are your small intestines. Well, not your small intestines, <laughs> a cat's small intestine. <laughs> I was like, not yours. And then um, the other one we talked about is the falciform ligaments, which is this line that you see right here, running right in the middle of the liver, and it's securing it to the... Um, bottom of the diaphragm. So see here is your diaphragm right here. And so it's connecting the liver to the diaphragm. So it's securing it within that place. So one more time, I just wanna make sure everybody's clear about this. Um, mesentery proper is the folds that you see kind of that sheath, very clean looking. Greater omentum and lesser omentum are both associated with the, in, uh, sorry, with the stomach. And then falciform ligament is associated with your liver, connecting it to the diaphragm. Now, one quick note, guys. Not every organ in our digestive system or in the abdominal pelvic region has a mesentery, which means it's not necessarily secured by another structure. These are outside this double membrane, and they're called retroperitoneal organs, as in they're not part of that double membrane. And these organs include your pancreas, duodenum, which was the first part of this small intestine, ascending and descending colon, which is the beginning and end of the colon, and then rectum, which is the end of the uh, digestive path. So remember these organs, these are part, of, they're not part of the peritoneal system. Uh, they don't have double membranes wrapped around them. Uh, they are held to their place by other means, not by mesenteries. Okay, what time is it? Okay, right. I'm going to talk about the four layers of the alimentary canal, and that's where we're going to stop. Uh, so alimentary canal is uh, basically, again, starting from the mouth all the way to the anus. And if you look at the, basically, the wall of these organs, um, doesn't matter if it's a mouth or a small intestine or a stomach or esophagus, doesn't matter. They have four main layers that form this tube. 
um, the innermost layer. So if this is, this is basically where your food passes through. This is space right here is where your food passes through. Uh, that space right here is referred to as the lumen, which is basically the central opening. The first layer that surrounds it, which is the immediate layer next to the lumen, is called the mucosa. It is kind of self-explanatory, I hope. Mucosa basically means what? It's made up of mucous membrane. What is its goal, guys? What do you think it's going to do? What is mucosa going to do? <laughs> I'm just going to write it. Lubrication, because it's mucus, right? So it's, it's slimy. What is mucus? It's slimy, right? So it's going to uh, lubricate it. So it has epithelium, which is basically um, a single layer of cells and then a mucous membrane right underneath it. What you have underneath that, the second layer, so we're working our way outward, is a layer called submucosa. So submucosa contains a lot of blood vessels and lymphatic vessels. You also have a lot of nerve fibers. So basically it can tell you your pain. So if there is any problem with your digestive tract, that's where it gets uh, identified. And you also are going to have a significant supply of blood vessels, which means that's where your, what happens? What process happens if you have blood? Anybody? <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna write it. Absorption, <clears throat> not infection, absorption. Uh, so if you have blood, what does that mean? It means that food that you have broken down already, going back to the earlier picture I was showing you guys, remember this? So food that you broke down through your digestive system now can move through your blood vessels. So that, that absorption that we mentioned here happens at the second layer or your submucosa lining. Now, the next layer we have, the name is kind of self-explanatory, muscularis externa. Muscularis implies that it contains a lot of muscles. Now, the type of muscles you're going to have is a smooth muscle. So a smooth muscle is what it's made up of. Most of the digestive system has two layers of muscles, what we call circular muscles and longitudinal muscles, with the exception of the stomach, which has the third layer. And I'll talk about that later. What do you think this layer is going to do, guys? What do you think muscularis externa going to do? What is muscles going to do for us? Okay, they do contract. So pushing, what was the proper word for pushing food? Peristalsis, they also gonna do what? What's the other job they do? Propulsion and peristalsis, yeah, and then start with an S. Segmentation, right? Breaking down to food to little pieces. So what I mentioned here, remember these pictures? So both the peristalsis, which is moving the food through the digestive system and segmentation, both happen in relation to your third layer. So um, peristalsis and segmentation. Sorry, I kind of run out of room. And then basically to secure everything in place, uh, we wrap it with a very thin layer on the outside, and that layer is called serosa. Um, what is serosa made up of? Um, it's made up of epithelium and connective tissue. Um, however, if I don't have epithelium, um, that layer is called adventitia. So if I have both epithelium and connective tissue, we call it serosa, which is a really common thing. However, if you only have connective tissue and no epithelium, that's called adventitia. And don't ask me why they gave it two different names. <laughs> because, because anatomies are crazy. Just okay, so here again in our picture, we had the lumen, which is the center, the mucosa lining. Look at the amount of blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatic vessels. So that's your submucosa layer. 
Again, you can see all the blood vessels and nerves. And then what you see here, this layer and this layer, these are your muscularis layer or muscularis external layer. And then this layer that's been flipped to the side, that's your adventitia or serosa, which is the layer that surrounds the whole thing. Any question, guys? Any last minute questions? <laughs> 